This is, of course, not, this, this is not the Bible Reloaded. Was... Science is interesting, and if you don't agree, you can fuck off. And what is the point of the Catholic Church if it says, oh, well, we couldn't know better because nobody else did? Then what are you for? <laughs> I have no problem with the spiritual beliefs of other fuckers, while those beliefs don't impact on the happiness of others. Using religion to dictate legislation is un-American, but it's happening. And admire the man who said, yes, I'll gut my kid to show my love of God, I'd say no, fuck you. Ben, we have to be able to criticize bad ideas. This but moment, why this moment when is the mother load of bad ideas. When yeah. someone's arguing with me that the Earth is 5,000 years old, <laughs> yes, I'm smiling. So if I offend some of you, I don't mean to offend you personally. I may offend some of your ideas, but I don't, that doesn't bother me at all. I'm talking about what the book actually says. If God didn't create the sun till the fourth day, how would four days already pass? Miracles are impossible by definition. I'm Jesus fucking Christ. Ding, 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 ding. And then everyone's going to expect it to be like, oh, I don't want to let. But actually, it's just us when we're going to come in then. Yeah. Okay. Just be like, welcome to the Watchtower and Awakening podcast. Uh, we're live from the top of the Watchtower. Hi there. So uh, I'm Mr. Watchtower, your host. I'm with here with my co host. Finally, once more, is Norris. Hi, Norris. Hi, Mr. Watchtower. Uh, hey. It's good to be back. It's been a while. I think I did actually tell everybody that you went to London to uh, to enjoy yourself. Oh, was that the excuse you mm-hmm. used? Okay. So yeah. you didn't tell them that I had a anal reconstructive <laughs> surgery? <laughs> actually, um, it, it's approaching Christmas. It's now December the 15th, and December the 15th commemorates Christopher Hitchens' uh, memorial. Three years to the day. I can't believe three years has gone. I know. Okay, so uh, to commemorate the hitch, uh, I'm going to grab some ice. I'm going to slam this into these, uh, what are they called? Are they called tumblers? Um, Whiskey glasses, mate. Yeah, whiskey tumblers, yeah. I've got, uh, here I have Johnny Walker Black Label, which is apparently uh, Christopher Hitchens' favourite whiskey. Whiskey, here we go. And this is now being poured into a non-branded whiskey glass. And now it's being poured into a, a Jack Daniels branded mm. whiskey glass, which is a sacrilege in the pub tray. It is, but nobody can really see that, so let's just pretend it's not happening. Oh yeah, cheers, not a, a Jack Daniels glass. Cheers to the hitch. Cheers to the hitch. To the hitch, everybody. <sighs> Bloody hell, that's really nice. Isn't it? Really nice. Hmm. Well done, the hitch. Hmm. Just the exact same one that he drank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Merry Christmas, Norris. Merry Christmas, Mr. Watchtower, and a Happy New Year. I have posed the question to atheists. If you're an atheist, do you celebrate Christmas and why? Because it's a question that I get most often at this time of year. So I wrote a blog post about it. So feel free to have a look on watchtowerawakening.com. Uh, it's the most recent blog post. Uh, an atheist celebrates Christmas. Uh, that basically summarises my thoughts, so I'm not going to talk too much about what I think, because uh, people can have a little look at that. Um, wh- what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce each person, we're just going to have a little list and we're going to comment. The very first person is my other co-host, Bonaventure. Ooh. So Bonaventure. Yes, yes, yes. We're asking atheists, um, if you celebrate Christmas... I do. ...which you do... I do. Uh, m- well, sh- should I say, this comes from many Christians, right? Christians are like, well, why are you celebrating uh, our Christian event mm-hmm. of Christmas uh, if you're not, in fact, a Christian? Okay. Ooh, that's not an atheistic thing to do. Mm-hmm. So I thought I'd pose the question to atheists. Um, why do you celebrate Christmas? For what point? Okay, so... Um Tradition, definitely. We've always celebrated Chris- Christmas and as a religious holiday in my younger years. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now I think for me, it's just about spending time with family. As you know, I'm a giver. So I love treating friends and family to presents and spoiling them. And yeah. and, and that's what it's about. It's just about celebrating having amazing people around. 
Brilliant, yeah. So so your your view is uh, like the Tim Minchin view, you know, that Christmas song that yes. I really like Christmas. Yes. But I'd rather break bread with Dawkins and Desmond to, yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. 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 I just like, it's not about anything religious. It's just about being with friends and family and spending time and treating each other and alcohol. It's always about alcohol. Nice. So, so obviously for you, because you're an atheist, there is no religious connotations to it. Obviously, there's not. Uh, But it's called it's called Christmas because it's the mess of Christ. Absolutely. Uh, But you know, Jesus doesn't really factor very largely in your life. No, he doesn't. He is an absolutely irrelevant point in my life. Absolutely. So, 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 so what we're saying is, festival is kicking off. Yeah. You're going to be a part of the party. I'm a huge part of the party, as you know. And that's it, isn't it? Yeah. Excellent. I like to party. Uh, moving on. So Norris, what we just established that um, our, or rather my co- my other co-host, Bonaventure, uh, she's a party animal. The festivities is kicking off and she's going to celebrate it to its fullest, hand out presents, enjoy herself and have copious amounts of alcohol and Jesus is an irrelevancy. She really sold that to me then. I feel like I would like to be sharing a day with her the old Bonaventure on Christmas, because she sounds like a, a bundle of fun on Christmas Day. <laughs> fun time gal. Yeah. And as she is such a giver. She is. And very rarely receives. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel that being in her presence on Christmas would also be quite lucrative <laughs> in the present department. <laughs> it could, which will explain yeah. why I'll be seeing her at least on Christmas Eve. Yeah. But actually, to be honest with you, that sounds very similar to my view. I think that's similar to almost everybody's view. Yeah. Um, whether or not they are Christian, it's, yeah. it seems. Uh, but we'll we, we'll uh, we'll listen to some mm. some more people coming up. But we'll uh, but, but the, I, I think that's generally the gist, or it is in my sort of in my in my general life, you know, work life and things like that. That tends to be it. Even the people that sort of claim to be real Christians, mm. I don't think they've ever mentioned Jesus once. Well, they wouldn't do to you. Probably not to me. I might bite. Okay, next up. Next is. Next up is Godless Smeged. You can follow him at Godless Smeged. Uh, Godless Smeged did a um, did a podcast, and I think he might be resuming once he gets uh, time and funds. I guess maybe. Um, and it was kind of like half atheist podcast asking people things about religion and obviously as the name would lead you to believe he's also a huge red dwarf fan so he asks people about their favorite episode and you know what what kind of what kind of red dwarf stuff they're into yeah mm. so i love a bit of red dwarf and uh, i love a bit of atheistic talk so godless mega is my kind of guy cool i tried to get into red dwarf because it seemed like a cool thing to do at one point and i thought it was a bit overrated sorry that, yeah, you, you might look at me like that, Mr. White Traveller. I hope Godless Smeghead's not listening. No. Ladies and gentlemen, Godless Smeghead. Hello, this is Godless Smeghead off Twitter. And a very, very happy winter solstice to all the Watchtower and Awakening podcast listeners, as well as our host at Apostates Awake. He's asked me to just record a few words about what Christmas means to me and if I celebrate it, etc. Um, As most of you who follow me know, I used to be a very devout Christian, Uh, I used to go to church, used to totally buy into the whole Christian bullshit, because basically I was indoctrinated into it. So when I was a kid, Christmas was a really special time for me. I can't remember being a kid actually ever experiencing a white Christmas, but the build up to Christmas, the, the, the time that, you know, it's a magical time of year when you're a kid, you get presents, you get, you know, the occasional very sneaky alcoholic drink if your parents will let you have it. Mine certainly did. And uh, no, it's just a very special time of year. Um, being a Christian as I was, um, it was a great time to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And I used to go caroling and I went to midnight mass in my teen years, even though I wasn't a Roman Catholic. So yes, I used to celebrate it very, very religiously, if you'll pardon the pun. But as I got older, I saw how commercialized it all was and just how transparent it was. And it was just an excuse for people to make money. So the magic went out of it for me and I stopped celebrating it really in my early 20s, even though I still felt deeply religious and even though I still felt, 
you know, the, the need to celebrate the birth of Jesus every December the 25th. I didn't actually celebrate it with the magic that I used to. But when I became an atheist, it was just completely clear to me that um, the whole thing was a lie. What Christians like to say um, is the meaning of Christmas Day, which is peace on earth and goodwill to all men. Why should that be for Christmas Day? Why should, shouldn't that be for June the 25th as well as December the 25th? Peace on earth and goodwill to all men should be all year round, every day, all day, 24-7. So that's my thoughts on Christmas. Um, if I have to give it a name, I do celebrate the winter solstice. Paganism has started to interest me. So, you know, I celebrate the winter solstice now. Anyway, I've rambled on long enough about this. Um, I shall let other people explain what it means to them. But I just wanted to say a very happy Christmas to you all. And I hope you eat lots and drink even more and don't wake up with any bad hangovers. Take care and have a great festive season. God, a smeghead there. Excellent um, to hear his views on Christmas there. Yeah, he's, he's, um, so he went through the being very religious kind of phase and really wanting to celebrate Jesus' birth. Jesus' birth was a big deal to him at Christmas. And then as he sort of moved away from that and realised how commercial it all was, it totally turned him off it. And he also mentioned um, peace and will to all men. Why can't that be all the time? Why is that just a Christmas thing? Well, Isn't I think, that- if you, I think to be honest with you... Um, if you ask, I don't want to say the majority of Christians, but if you ask your average Christian person, um, you know, why why is it peace and will to, to all men on just Christmas Day? I think the answer you'll get is, well, it's not. It is every day. It's just a time but, to reflect. Yeah, I think, I think it's probably a bit harsh to think that the majority of Christians believe that Christmas is about goodwill to all men and the rest of the year isn't. I think the majority would say, no, it is, but we're going to use this to emphasise, you know, and I think partly, partly because Christmas can be the worst time of year for some people. Yeah. If you're lonely, you're likely to be extremely lonely at Christmas. If you're isolated, you're going to feel more isolated. If you're, if you're angry, you're going to probably feel more angry. If you're sad, again, I think it's, it's one of those times of year where, most of your emotions are magnified. I th- so if you're I think, happy, I think if you've got a nice family, if you've got lots of friends, you're going to have a great time. You're going to have lots of time with your family, lots of time with your friends, so it's something to look forward to, something to enjoy. But if you lack those things, it can be yeah. a very sad I think, time. I think it's the equivalent of, um, you know, like if, if you're going through a breakup and then you suddenly realise, you suddenly recognise song lyrics that you never really cared about, and you suddenly realise that you know maybe a film that's on is like now speaking to you like it didn't before. Yeah. I think I think that's heightened during Christmas because people that may not have somebody, I don't just mean as another half. I mean like people who don't have somebody around, um, or they don't have their family around, or the family uh, like it like in many Jehovah's Witnesses case or ex witnesses the family don't celebrate it. There is a there's a conspicuous absence of those things. And whilst there is an absence of those things, there's also the the subject matter is like on every TV program, on every advert, everything that you're looking at and everything that you're hearing, it's there, isn't it? it it's it's like um, you know, like if if uh, if you've if you've just broken up with somebody, you suddenly see everybody holding hands or something like that. You know, it's the equivalent of that. It's like oh, look at how cosy we all are inside, all of us laughing and enjoying each other's company and and giving and receiving and everybody loving each other and stuff. Mm. And what if you don't have that? What if you don't have people? To- well, interestingly, I heard something recently, which is that if you happen to rent a house out hmm. and you need a new tenant in the new year, apparently January is a great time of year to get a new tenant because Why? lots of people split up over the festive period. Really? And they need a fast solution to the breakup. Okay. So rented accommodation becomes very popular just after Christmas, apparently. Right. Well, you heard it so here Landlords, first. if you've heard this, you can capitalise on people's pain in yes. January. 10% increase due to people's tears. <laughs> yeah, up the bloody rent. Yeah. Get the rent out. <laughs> yeah. you know? Rent paid with people's tears. Yeah. And mm. they'll only notice the pain too much when the uh, the pain has subsided. Next podcaster is known as Coranify Me. Mm. Uh, the Coranify Me podcast is, uh, is a hilarious podcast. Um, 
were basically, uh, it's all about reading the Quran. Mm. I encourage you to go and check it out. Well, you can follow the Quranify Me podcast at Quranify Me. That's a Q-U-R-A-N-I-F-Y-M-E. Mm. So without further ado, here's uh, the Quranify Me podcast. Hey there, Watchtower listeners. This is Paul of Quranify Me. Of course the Corona Fanatic Army celebrates Christmas. Why in the world wouldn't we celebrate the death of the skinny Jew god? Wait, what? Wrong day? Ah, hell. I can't keep all these fables straight. This one died this way. This one died that way. This one died on this day. The other one died on that day. It's all so fantastic and almost unbelievable. Anywho, yes, as an ex-Christian, now atheist, I do celebrate the annual opportunity to participate in the joy of pure capitalism, to spend a little of my pathetically feeble fortune and manifest my love and appreciation for those few special people in my life through the giving of gifts. The real reason for the season, personally, is to strip away most of the distractions of life and remind myself that I have very important people surrounding me who love me dearly and support me in all of my craziness. Hell, look what they let me do with my limited free time. It's an opportunity to step back away from the hustle of real life and take a few days per year to frickin' breathe and enjoy the simple pleasures that life has to offer. Life is pure joy when you can celebrate the secular and very real pleasures it provides. Like sitting with your spouse over a few cups of coffee and talking about our dreams. Or watching my kids harass each other and remember that they love to hate each other and wouldn't have it any other way. To play a simple game of chess with my daughter, whether or not I kick her ass. And to remember that no matter how stressful everyday life is and how much it could be better if this happened or that happened, that all in all, I'm damn lucky to be alive and live in a country where I'm free to speak my mind. That is why we celebrate that season, and for no other reason. Happy Heathen Holidays to you and yours from Coronify Me. So there you go, Paul of Coronify Me. Uh, I'm gradually seeing a pattern forming where the heathens that are celebrating Christmas, much like myself, it is a time for them to sort of come together with the friends and family, give, receive, have a bit of fun, take a bit of time away from work and think about things that are special to you. At no point does Jesus come into this, am I right? Uh, you're right, for the heathens, that's true. Um, and, it, and actually, do you know what? I think that's the same for most people. I, w- I also notice a pattern that um, people are frustrated by the commercialization. Yes, definitely, yeah. Now, the question I'd have is, right, what is the commercialization of Christmas? I understand what it is. I understand that it's about making money mm-hmm. during a festive period, a special time. But ultimately, without the commercialization, with, without the commercialization, would it not just be a religious festival? <sighs> Interesting. <laughs> well, that, yeah, no, that's impressive. Um, the short answer is, I'm not too sure, to be honest. Um, <clears throat> I think in some way the commercialization of religion will have, it, it will have made the religious attributes of, 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 of a Christian Christmas uh, less prominent. So in some ways it's kind of... It's strange, isn't it? It's, Without the it, commercialization, it would be a very different Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it, it is... Occasion. The, 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 the commercialization of religion will have also helped to secularise mm-hmm. Christmas. Yeah, so, that's, I think that's, in fact, that's a very good way of putting it. I was just thinking. Yeah. Mm, that's so I agree that Christmas has become far too commercial. I, I've got kids. As has any it. holiday. Yeah. And yeah, I get it. it it's, a, it's a pressure for, for a lot of families. You know, you, 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 you're constantly being advertised to, um, you're, being, you're expected to buy lots of gifts for your kids, for your family, and especially when you've got young kids, the competition between the parents sometimes. I mean, I don't buy into this at all, and neither does my wife, luckily, but when you hear what some of the kids get at Christmas, it's frightening. Yeah. My daughter's seven-year-old friend got a laptop, an iPad, 
and a mobile phone last Christmas. And bear in mind, they're not even middle class, these people. They're not even middle class. It's ridiculous, isn't it? It's, and I think what it is, it's the pressure that people put themselves under because of the commercialization of, 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 of Christmas that people feel that they have to spoil the kids because they want to see the kids overwhelmingly happy on Christmas Day. Mm-hmm. In the reality, you're creating a bit of a monster because you're creating a spoiled child who expects them year on year. Yeah. Which is a shame. Now, come back to the commercialization thing. Um, back in the day, when it was a purely a religious festival, there was a giving of gifts part of it, but it would have just been a very modest... Yeah, but something that somebody made or somebody oh, found yeah. or somebody picked or something like that. It would have been a gesture. Yeah. A gesture, something to give. Something something which, by the way, predates uh, predates Christmas mm. in, in a huge fashion, but but still, yeah. So so it's, so it's if you could, you could argue that the commercialisation is almost like a natural, it's a natural evolution of something that was already there as part of the festival. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's a it's, debate it, whether, it's a debate whether, whether did secularism cause the commercialization of christmas or or did commercialization of christmas make things more secular exactly because did the second did, did when it, for example right i don't know when this happened i've not researched it but when christmas became more commercialized mm-hmm. more about giving presents yeah did the secular community then go ah oh, that's actually a really good idea Let's we'll have a bit of that. We'll have a we'll we'll make it a special occasion as well, and we'll we'll um, and and then it becomes even more commercialized. Or did it happen another way? Did the secular community say that's you know we're kind of forced into having Christmas? We see the the benefits of spending more time with our family and stuff like that, hmm. but we'll put more of an emphasis on the gifts. And then it becomes more commercialised. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. It, it it reminds me of the the famous Tim Minchin Christmas song when he says uh, about an ancient Palestinian press ganged into pl- an ancient Palestinian press ganged into selling PlayStation and beers. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's 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 the lyric. Uh, so that's quite interesting. I mean, it it stands to reason that uh, it it stands to reason that there wasn't really a secular community as such before presents were given because that was, that's an ancient thing. But yeah, basically as things have commercialized, it, it, it's, it's weird because you'd, you'd have to sort of hit that from every angle. That that would be, that you know, that would be a full on, that would be a book in itself mm. because you'd have to follow the secular, secularization process and also the commercialization process. And you'd have to see whether you know, because the two of them walking hand in hand may not necessarily be causal. Mm. It that'd might, be, it, it might be, be a coincidence. That'd be quite a good... Uh, uh, I didn't go to university, so I can't remember... What's the final... Dissertation. Dissertation, yeah. that's the one. That'd be quite a good topic for a dissertation at university. It would, and, and to, to be fair, it's probably even too much for a dissertation. It, it'd, have to be a, it'd have to be a serious dissertation. Mm. Yeah. A PhD. Anyway, I feel that's going to be... Uh, that's that's too much. I, I feel like every time we every time we summarise what's just happened, we open up a can of worms that have okay. to be an entire podcast. Just cut it where I mean need to cut it. Okay, up next is um, Andy Lee. Andy Lee is uh, the host of the You Without God podcast, and um, I was special guest for episode five of the You Without God podcast. This is the Skype one. Uh, yeah, yeah. So if you'd like to have a little look at youwithoutgod.com, uh, go over and check out and uh, follow Andy Lee at Rooty Kitty. Uh, but you can also follow her at You Without God for the for the actual podcast. Uh, he co-hosts with uh, Chris Chrisminski. You follow him on Twitter as well. Uh, so yeah, they, they interviewed me for episode five of the You Without God podcast, where I sort of explained about my my upbringing and what sort of caused me to move away from the Jehovah's Witness religion. Or your downbringing. My downbringing, as my mum and dad would view it, yes. The the losing of a sheep from the flock. Yeah, so uh, Andy Lee, here he is. Hi, I'm Andy Lee from the You Without God podcast. And yes, 
I do celebrate Christmas. I enjoy many aspects of this holiday. For instance, I love to spend time with family and friends and not working so much. I like thinking about the gifts I'll give and enjoying food and festive feelings around me. I like going to Christmas markets, hearing carols sung, and seeing sparkly trees and snow and reindeer and all the other stuff that goes along with it. I enjoy the gifts of time and genuine care that I'm so fortunate to be given. Like many people, I really think very little about the religious aspects as those have ceased to have any meaning to me. My family and my friends are in the here and now and the opportunity to have a communal celebration is a good one. It's also a chance to think about those less fortunate and to try to help them, remembering that I'm tremendously privileged in being able to have the life I do. I really don't care whether it was a pagan festival or not. In its modern sense, it's firmly Christian in origin. But in fact, I find I'm less annoyed by the religious roots of the holiday than I am by the over-commercialization. More than any other holiday, it's become a season for mindless consumerism where desire and envy are stoked by the constant advertising and pressure to buy more, have more, and give more. Whoever claims that there's a true meaning behind all of that is probably deluding themselves. There is none. It's just a cover for marketing you more crap that you don't really need in the name of making you feel good about yourself. But there's something to be said for taking time out to just enjoy yourself, to eat well, to sleep well and enjoy the company of those you love, and even those who drive you completely crazy. It just wouldn't be Christmas otherwise. Once more, commercialization of Christmas. It, it's funny, isn't it? It's, it, it's, it's, becoming, it's becoming even more of a theme. It's like, you know what? We get time off work. We get chance to be with the families. We get to give. We get to receive. We get to help out one another we get to all be together uh and it you know it's a time isn't it for sure and it's a little time where you can just take a break from work slow the pace of your life down and spend a little bit of time with loved ones that's kind of what everyone seems to be getting at mm. and the same with andy lee here mm. what i find interesting is that a man like andy lee hi andy by the way thank you for your for your uh, involvement in, in this podcast mm. um yeah, um, what I find interesting is that for a man like Andy Lee who actually talks about religion from an atheist perspective, so he's obviously got strong views about religion, he's more irked by the commercialization than he is. Rather the than the religious angle. aspect, yeah, okay. So um, it's almost like, the, it's almost like the, the balance, if you imagine it as a balance, and you've got sort of commercialization on one side of the balance and the religious aspects on the other. Religiosity. And the atheist is holding the center of the balancing mechanism. Like the blind justice statue. Yeah. Um, no, it's just interesting that, you know, I think it should, it's almost evidence of the fact that human beings just can't stop when enough's enough. <laughs> yeah. They can't. Yeah, no, you're right. We have to push it until everyone gets really pissed off. And then, I don't know, wh- how do you rein this in? It's going to take a collective, um, almost like a collective responsibility to say, right, enough's enough. We're not prepared to go into debt anymore for, for Christmas. We're not prepared to teach our children anymore that Christmas is about getting an expensive bunch of <coughs> excuse me, an expensive bunch of presents. It's not about that. You know, what's what's the first thing that kids talk about when they go back to school after Christmas? Is it how did you celebrate the birth of Jesus? Well, yeah, how did you know that that was like that? <laughs> no, I get what you're saying. It's yeah. gonna be what did you get for Christmas? What did you get? And then yeah? and then what happens is children from a very young age start to feel um they start to feel hard done by when they hear about all these things that other people have got and then they start to apply more pressure on the parents because they feel a little bit hard done by and it's and it might be a, it's a, a drip drip they start effect. they start to feel one of the main sins envy en- yeah envy gluttony 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 yeah exactly um, yeah. but no it's I mean I'll give you an example my uh, nine year old daughter this year she really wants a tablet or a phone right now a lot of people listening to this might think well that's fair enough you know one or the other 
It's not, mm-hmm. too, it's not too bad because we've become sort of conditioned to believe that you know you you get that you should spend a certain amount at Christmas. Now a phone's out of the question because a nine year old does not need a phone. A tablet. We don't need a tablet. We have a little iPad. She can use that. She can use that whenever she wants, right? So it's not like she needs one. Why do you think she wants a phone or a tablet? Uh, I'm just going to take a shot in the dark here and say because her friends have got one. That's my nine-year-old's words. All of my friends have got a phone, a tablet, a laptop. So that's why I want one. That's the reason. Hmm. And and it's... Which, which is understandable if you see it from her point of view. It's understandable. Yeah. But not necessary. But kids just don't need these things. I mean, you can. we have one iPad mini in the family. And, you know, you, it, basically it's there for to be used. We can all we can all use it. You know, the kids can use it. While supervised, I might add. Yeah. Are you, I, I love it. I love it. Are you, you, <laughs> you say it like you don't usually get first dibs when you're trying to learn a new piece on your guitar. Oh, yeah. And, and obviously, <laughs> there's always a... There's always, when the kids want to use it, they always have to wait for at least 10 minutes because I have to make sure that the history is cleared. Of course, yeah. You know, you got to make sure that there's there's no remnants of father's sins. <laughs> Daddy's uh, just practicing his mantra. Yes. Uh, so obviously, you know, it, it's, I don't know, it's really, it's quite stressful at times for parents because, you know, there's a lot of weak parents out there who give in immediately to the, man, the demands of the kids. And to be fair, it's hard to know who to blame. I guess the best people to blame are the marketeers, people who stick the adverts on the TVs, people who stick the adverts in the magazines, who tell your kids, this is what you should have, this is what you need, this is what you want. And then they apply the pressure to the parents. Which which, which reminds me of uh, Bill Hicks when he says, if, you, if you're into marketing, Kill yourself. Kill yourself. Boom. If you're into marketing, kill yourself. And, and then the audience laughs and he says, that's not even a joke. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm saying if you're into marketing, kill yourself. No, this, is, this isn't a funny bit of the show. Yeah, uh, this <laughs> is a funny bit. That I'm, I'm saying if your job is to get people interested in things that they don't necessarily need so that they feel like they have to buy shit that yeah. they couldn't possibly need and use their only funds to try and keep up with the Joneses, kill yourself. You can't put a price on everything, you dirty, horrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but yeah, it's, it's difficult. And, and yeah. The commercialization of Christmas is without doubt the most poisonous aspect. But because the family aspects of it, the, the time with the family, the, the bit of time off work, time with your friends, because that is so important to people and so enjoyed, we still we're still happy to go through the motions and to and to allow the, the commercialization of Christmas to continue in the way it does. But it's going to take people to say, no, I'm not going to do this. What is the real meaning of Christmas? Some families get it absolutely bob on. They know how to get the balance right. But other families, I'm afraid, you know who you are. Up next is James Payton, who is the main host of the JW podcast. Uh, former Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, basically talking about Jehovah's Witness related stuff or ex Jehovah's Witness related stuff. Um, they've only done like three episodes so far, and they're already very successful. I, s- I say that the I say that the the hosts that are on the show that they're former Jehovah's Witnesses, but technically, I'm pretty sure if if I remember rightly from the podcast I was listening to, James Payton James Payton is technically still a Jehovah's Witness because he has not been disfellowshipped. Because he has a loophole, because he's holding one of them, one of the Jehovah's Witnesses in the hierarchy to ransom. Uh, but I'll find out the specifics on that, and we'll talk about that another time, or I might write about it on the blog. I'm not too sure. But um, but the long story short is, he is he's podcasting an apostate heathen blog for former Jehovah's Witnesses, or even current Jehovah's Witnesses, depending on what they want to know. Um, and technically. Jehovah's Witnesses that are still Jehovah's Witnesses can listen to the words coming out of his mouth because he has not yet been uh, disfellowshipped. So he's mm. a Jehovah's Witness who can talk to Jehovah's Witnesses. And even though he's kind of doing something that's a bit apostate-like, I don't know whether you'd be able to call him an actual apostate. Hmm. Mm, it's, interesting. In, it's an interesting one. Yeah. A bit like lapsed Catholics, really. 
Uh, I still probably ma- I still make the roll. Yeah, but we discussed in a previous podcast, didn't we? The the difference, the clearest difference I can see between a religion and a cult is that religions will pretty much let you do anything and still be part of the religion. Cults are very serious about the rules. Mm-hmm. Uh, so remember, like it must have been like four or five podcasts ago, we were talking and uh, and I was saying to you that you could pretty much do anything and you would not be excommunicated from the Catholic Church. And I do mean anything. I mean rape, murder, child molestation, whatever. It doesn't matter. You could still be Catholic. The, the only time you... You almost just described then the uh, how to get uh, promoted within the Catholic Church. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're not even far from the truth, to be fair. Not necessarily promoted, but how to... Uh, how Sorry, to, Mom. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> how, uh, how, to, how to maintain your position in the Catholic Church. Yeah. Yeah? Like uh, that episode of South Park. You'll never make a deacon at this point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so James Payton of the JW podcast. Here we go. Hi, my name is James Payton and I'm the lead host of the popular Jehovah's Witness show, JW Podcast. I've also been running jehovahswitnessblog.com or JWB for short since the start of 2010. Since leaving the witnesses towards the latter stages of 2009, I've still not fully celebrated Christmas. I would say that it's not because I've not wanted to, but I couldn't for the first few years of my exit from the Watchtower organization. As my wife was still a witness, it took me, I would say, a good two years before I could break down her indoctrination. So sometime in 2012, she had completely left the watchtower but we didn't celebrate it then or the year after because my mother-in-law still is a Jehovah's Witness so it's been very difficult but I do love Christmas even though I'm an atheist and and also Alexia is an atheist it's a great time of year as most people seem to be a bit happier than usual and here in Cyprus most people get bonuses as well which always helps both my wife and I have promised each other that we will get a Christmas tree by December 2015 and celebrate this festive time properly. Probably even getting each other gifts and sending the occasional Christmas card. Plus, there's a real big added bonus that the new Star Wars film is going to be out next Christmas. Anyway, I hope this has helped. Cheers. Bye bye. Okay, James Payton of the JW blog and JW podcast. Um, let me explain before you go taking us off on a tangent why it's much different and much more difficult uh, for the sort of celebration of Christmas for people like James and XJWs in general. Um, most Christians always celebrated Christmas. So their change from celebrating Christmas, their, in air quotes, traditional way, in comparison to how they now celebrate it as an atheist, is essentially with every tradition, you know, every every light, every piece of tinsel, every Christmas jumper, every Christmas carol. It's exactly the same with the omission of anything religious, and that's it. That's the only difference. So to them, they're pretty much carrying on the usual traditions that they've always been used to. Uh, for Jehovah's Witnesses or ex-Jehovah's Witnesses to then begin to celebrate Christmas, it's completely different because they were actually forbidden from the celebration of Christmas. So this is like an, it's almost like a new tradition they take on board based on the festive period. It's different, it's different for James because, uh, like he said, they've never had a Christmas tree and he's going to celebrate it in his words, like the sort of proper way. Uh, next year, he's promised him and his wife, they'll, they'll get a Christmas tree and they'll, and they'll celebrate Christmas the way they feel like celebrating Christmas. Because up until now, that has never been a thing. Uh, so it, it's, it, it's a strange, it's a strange sort of, it's a strange point of view to come from because uh, you have had the absence of Christmas your entire life until you leave the faith. So there isn't necessarily a there, there isn't a reason to celebrate it in the se- in a religious sense because your religious indoctrination up until that point has been the exact opposite. It's been Christmas is wrong. Christmas is pagan. Mm. You should not celebrate Christmas. So instead of just kind of losing your religiosity and carrying on with your tradition, you 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 are actively celebrating something that you always viewed to be wrong. Thanks, James. But it's interesting. He still feel it. Still sounds like he feels like an outsider. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also, what I'd be interested in is, to, to, I'd, I'd be interested to ask James. It does. I mean. Why does he feel like they need 
to celebrate Christmas together. It's it almost sounds to me, reading between the lines, like it's a way of um, almost cementing the their new view of the world as atheists. So you say, is it, do, you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think- so like you say, because there's no real reason to celebrate Christmas as such. You don't have to give Christmas cards. You don't have to have a tree. You don't have to give presents. Yeah. You could just see it as a holiday, I a think, longer, I, a, a I think longer it's, period it, of time together. Or? I think it's part of your recalibration process as, as, as you deconvert, because you, the, the way I saw it was, it wasn't that I desperately wanted to celebrate Christmas. It wasn't like, a, oh, I can't wait to be able to celebrate Christmas. It wasn't really on my radar as one of the things I was thinking about as, as a, you know, as a lever from the JW organization. It's more about um, you kind of putting everything towards your new sort of, n- your new found secularism, if you will. So if you have left the JW organization and you and you are now not religious and you know you're an atheist, you can now take things on board with a blank slate. And I think that's what religious people don't really realize. Ah, what, well, this, what, this is what I was going to say, right? Is it a blank slate? Because on one hand, I would say, you know, if, from, from the position of someone like James or yourself, when you left the Jehovah's Witnesses, it's almost like a really cool opportunity to make Christmas whatever you want Christmas to be. So you can say, uh, you can sort of say, well, I like that idea, I like that idea, but I'm not too keen on that idea. And you can just yeah. tailor Christmas to be whatever it is you want it to be, which is exciting, nice. You know, you can do that. You can cherry pick Christmas hmm. almost in the way that Christians Everybody cherry does, pick yeah. the Bible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> But the other side is, you know, is there a certain amount of pressure, right? Once you've left the Jehovah's Witnesses and you enter a new phase of your life, you then have to, you, you maybe feel like, okay, I'm, I'd like to be accepted in my new life. And what do I need to do to kind of, uh, to do to do the things that, other people do that aren't Jehovah's Witnesses, right? So, for example, you can't get away from Christmas. You just can't get away from it. It happens every year, and the vast majority of people in England, in particular, and obviously in America, um, any Christian country, let's say. Um, Whoa! What? I'm taking exception to the words "Christian country." Oh yeah, sorry. Any, any, sorry. Yeah, you're right. Okay, I'll say that back. Okay, I get you. Uh, I'll, re- I'll, I'll rephrase that. Any Christian country, um, <laughs> like England or America, um, I know what you're you saying. Mean, any, any Western Christ- country where Christianity tends to be more traditional be and prevalent part, 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 part of the her- heritage of the society. Of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any any country where Christianity is the best way to be <laughs> by the majority of people in that country. Get to uh, your point. Get to sorry. your point. Um, the majority of people in those kind of places, celebrate Christmas, right? Whether they do it from a, a religious point of view or from a secular point of view, right? Yeah. Now, once you've left a cult, in inverted commas, such as Jehovah's Witnesses, you then become part of the wider community in a mm-hmm. way you have never experienced before, Yeah. right? And my question would be, is there a certain pressure to celebrate Christmas from the point of view of an ex-Jehovah's Witness? So... I get the exciting side of it. Oh, I can tailor Christmas and say, I can make this a special time because it's never really felt like a special time before. So yeah. I'm looking forward to making it a special time. But how much of that comes from a pressure to fit in? I, do you want me to tell you from my point of view? Or? Well, tell me from someone else's point of view if you wow. want. But, oh, wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think I think you, you're, you were viewing it like more cynically than sceptically then because... From from my experience of like former Jehovah's Witnesses and myself, <clears throat> I'm a skinny. There, there was no there, there was no there was no desperate need to celebrate Christmas. It's just that once you sort of leave the faith, you are left in a situation then where the the only the only pressure that's ever been put on you around Christmas time is to not celebrate it. Your, your, the indoctrination process and the the literature and stuff explains about its pagan origins and things like that. 
once you kind of lose your religion and you lose your you lose your faith in God and and that just that no longer becomes a thing. Once you are secular, you start to take things on board by their merit as opposed to what you have already presupposed. Does that make sense? So so the I, I agree that Christian uh, sorry I agree that uh, Christmas is mostly cultural and mostly. Uh, secular these days in our sort of our neck of the woods of the earth um but most people celebrate it so it would stand to reason that around christmas time you will be invited places you know things are going on people might get a bit of time off work people are going out and you know having a good time and your only reason to not do those things is because your religion dictates that you cannot so once you lose the religion what reason is there for you to not take part in those things Th- those reasons just suddenly bleed away. So you think, huh, I- I'm not I'm not really bothered about the Jehovah's Witness part of Christianity. And I'm not really bothered about any part of Christianity because God does no longer God no longer factors into my life. Yeah. So I can now pretty much do what I want on my terms. Okay, so we kind of established before that there's there's essentially two strands to Christmas. There's the religious strand and the commercialization sort of strand. Okay, you can add a third which is Spending time with family and friends, okay, which um, defeats this argument that I'm about to make. So that's fine. <laughs> Good. Uh, <laughs> no. So I can just cut to the next thing. It's obvious that not being with people on Christmas Day would probably make you very sad. For the majority of people, that, that would happen because it either means that no one loves you or that you have no one who cares about you or, uh, or that, you know, it, it, it's... It's unthinkable to be on your own at Christmas, right? Which is why, you know, we need to look out for the elderly. We need to we need to be aware of neighbours on your street that are on their own at Christmas and to make sure they're doing something with someone at Christmas because it can be a really bad time. But mm. from the perspective of Jehovah's Witness, who's never celebrated Christmas and has been raised to um, to stay clear of, of all of that, would you feel worse at Christmas if you're on your own now that you're not a Jehovah's Witness. Okay, I'm with you. I get, I get what you're saying now. Yeah, um, I think when uh, when I began to celebrate Christmas, I didn't really do it consciously. It wasn't, I, di- I, didn't, had, I didn't have a thought of I will now celebrate Christmas. That, that, that wasn't really an issue. Um, the way I explained it to people was the same with birthdays. Now, as you will know, birthdays don't really factor into my life hugely. I will celebrate them because everybody else tells me that I should. They'll say, you know, it's your birthday in a few months, right? And I'll go, oh, yeah. But it, but it's not a huge deal to me because I don't know how it is for other former Jehovah's Witnesses. I can't really speak for them. But for me, the the sort of absence of it meant that I couldn't miss it. There was no nostalgia to it for me because it didn't exist. So, yeah, I, I can see what you mean. Um Maybe, maybe if you've just come from the Jehovah's Witness religion, there's every chance you could have left the religion and become a complete atheist, total secularist, and have no desire to celebrate Christmas whatsoever. You could sit there watching a bit of TV, ignoring the world at Christmas, and, and, how it, would that and it wouldn't really then? matter. Because from from the point of view of a of a, of a lapsed Catholic, hmm. when when Eid is celebrated, it. It means nothing to me. Exactly. Yeah. At all. So I don't feel hard done by because I'm not celebrating something. I don't feel uh I don't feel jealous of people who are celebrating something that means something to them. It doesn't affect me at all, right? It happens, I hear about it and it's fine. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so is that how Christmas feels yeah, yeah, to I you, really? Yeah, I guess. I mean not not to me now, because I because as as a as a secularist and atheist, I've adopted from society what I think is worth adopting. So, how many presents do you get at Christmas, and who tends to buy them? Buy you those presents? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't want people to feel sorry for me, but not very many. No. Um, <laughs> I feel really sorry. Well, I guess, I guess there's no there, there, <laughs> there's nobody there's nobody that's. Um, like my family don't celebrate Christmas. Uh, the people that are in my family that are still Jehovah's Witnesses obviously don't celebrate Christmas, and I wouldn't celebrate Christmas with them or for them. There's no point in me getting them a Christmas card or a present because 
they'd probably view that as an insult because they know that they know, I know, they're not celebrating. I think you should do that. I think you should so go that, really over the top I mean, I did, to, to be fair, I do ring my mum uh, at Christmas and then I sing Merry Christmas to her. Uh, likewise, on my birthday, I ring her up and I say "Happy birthday to me," uh, just you know, just to just to tease her a little. Right. Um, on your birthday, on my birthday, yeah. But yeah, yes. Yeah, so, so I have members of my family that are still Jehovah's Witnesses that have nothing to do with Christmas. So obviously, we don't celebrate Christmas together. That's that. I have members of my family that are no longer Jehovah's Witnesses, but we still don't really celebrate Christmas together. We will, you know, we'll go out for a couple of drinks and stuff and meet up because we've got time on our hands, which is part and parcel of the whole, you know, family getting together at Christmas. But we don't celebrate. We've never got each other a card or presents or anything. So I, between I have, you and your parents, is it a thing, Christmas? Right? No. Is it so? Okay. No, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's not. It's not on anybody's radar. Is it a, oh, so it's not a thing because it's not a thing. Is what I'm getting at. In other words, Christ, you, cri- Christmas to them, like you said, Christmas to them is <laughs> is what Eid is to you. Yeah. Would your mum and dad ever invite you over for a meal on Christmas Day? No, but not not because they thought they'd be celebrating Christmas. They just wouldn't because they'd assume I was doing something Christmassy. Okay. I presume. Well, this is it. It's an interesting uh, presumption. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they can't, in a society like ours, they cannot escape that Christmas is happening. They know it's Christmas Eve. Mm-hmm. They know it's Christmas Day because you can't avoid it. Mm-hmm. But they just don't treat it like anything. Like, my mum and dad would never dream of eating turkey on Christmas Day because mm-hmm. they'd feel like they were somehow partaking in, that, in it. Mm-hmm. Um, likewise, they'd never buy an Easter egg before Easter. As soon as Easter's gone... You get all the cheap Easter eggs. As soon as the cheap Easter eggs are on sale, yeah, Easter egg city. Mm. But it's no longer celebrating um, Easter for them, so they, mm. you know, they do that. Yeah. Why not? No, just it's interesting because you got a day off at Christmas. You, you, your parents know you're off at Christmas. Mm-hmm. Um, I presume they'll be off on Christmas Day because no one really, no one really works on Christmas Day anyway. Um, so. Well, they're retired, so they never work now. Okay, so the point I'm making is that they know you're off and they're off. So, would they not ask you to their house for a meal because it's Christmas? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they know they know that I sort of do things at Christmas. Like, they know I do things for my birthday. I just don't really discuss it in any depth with them because they don't want to know about it. Mm-hmm. So, we just kind of leave it amicable like that. I don't talk to them about it. They don't ask me questions about it. Mm-hmm. You can discuss it in hell. Which I assume may be just like James Payton. Mm. Yeah. Let's move on to the next person, shall we? Yeah. Because otherwise, this is going to be the longest podcast of all time. It's Adam here from the Herd Mentality Podcast, and joining me, I have Alan from Podcast Science on Switzerland. Alan, how you doing? Hi, I'm good. Being eaten by drop bears? Uh, not yet. Mm. Being eaten by flies. <laughs> That's a pain in the ass. Where are we at the moment? I have no idea. <laughs> Somewhere in the middle of Australia, there's a river, it's lovely. Yeah, geographically, we're halfway between Sydney and suicide. The fact is, uh, Alan has come over from Switzerland for a holiday to spend some time with me coming to the Australian Skeptics Convention, uh, spend some Christmas time with my family because we do it in November this year. Uh, purely and simply because everyone's going to be away and given that this is for another podcast for the wonderful people over at Watchtower and Awakening the podcast you'd like to know what we do for Christmas so let's walk you through it Alan landed in Australia what was it last Wednesday yeah last Wednesday evening and you spent 24 hours doing what uh, you mean <laughs> Prior to my arrival? No, after you arrived? Uh, the first 24 hours, I slept a bit. We had a couple of beers, I slept. And? Um, I visited Sydney, and then I got food poisoning. Yes, yeah, there we go. Yeah, it was go. wonderful. Australian food poisoning is the best uh-huh. sort of food poisoning. Yeah, it was really worth the trip. <laughs> uh, but the weekend, we'd planned to spend some time with my family in a place called Mossvale which is halfway between Sydney and Canberra. So we drove on down, and the premise was everybody everybody who came, we had friends, family, the works. There, there would have been about 20 people, yeah, maybe roughly. more. Mm-hmm. 
and everyone had to participate by bringing a gift that was wrapped in newspaper. But there were some rules for the gifts. What were the rules? Yeah, so the gift had to be second hand. It had to be shit, basically. <laughs> <laughs> it had to be fun. So it was more a question of humor than anything yeah. else. Because when we were giving these gifts, and it was brought about by random chance, you had to roll dice and, and then yeah. you could pick a gift. Then if you rolled the correct number, you could unwrap it. Etc. Etc. So it's a secret Santa or a, a play on uh, secret Santa. But at that uh, at that point, there was just so much more fun because you never know what you're going to get, who you're exactly. going to get it from, yeah. uh, whether or not it's going to be any good. And there's an element of surprise, and you can you can steal somebody else's gift. Like if you rolled a four or something, whatever it was you were then able to go and steal somebody else's gift. Mm -hmm. And, oh gosh, um, there was this tiny little... It was crap. I mean, all the, all the gifts were crap. But this particular gift <laughs> was super crap. It was a shopping trolley, and everyone seemed to want it. It was this tiny little... About the, about the size of a toaster, maybe. A bit yeah, even a toaster. smaller. Yeah. And for some reason, everybody wanted that. But there was some... There are actually some good gifts. There was a play on Monopoly called uh, Bibliopoly. Yeah, Bibliopoly. Bibliopoly. That? Yeah. That was crap. <laughs> it was total <laughs> crap, but it was but it funny. Was, it was good fun, you yeah. know. Do not pass go. Do not have fun. Do not have sex. Do not have, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> all the sorts of things that the Bible decrees. Yeah, meditate instead of go to jail. Yeah. That was no. good. Because <laughs> yeah. we know that that works. So, that's uh, that was... That was a good time at my parents' place. That was a lot of fun for Christmas. I know I like Christmas. Yeah, no, it was really brilliant, actually. It was my best Christmas probably ever. <laughs> um, not so only because of the weather. You know, having Christmas in, in the summer is kind of exotic. Well, you, this is your first time in Australia. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So uh, what's Christmas like for you? Um, well, it's more like in the books. It's usually very cold at Christmas time in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. uh, where I live, there isn't snow every year. Um, it does happen, like once in every 10 years you have a white Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually more traditional, more linked to um, both the Christian rules and the, yeah, the, the European folklore. Uh, that's so stoning witches. Thing. So yeah, you have Christmas trees. Um, you listen to to gospels, um, that mm. kind of crap. You have yeah, you have food. Everybody uh, argues with everybody else. That's, that's yeah, that's the one time in the year uh, <laughs> when people who usually don't want to meet <laughs> yeah. have to meet. <laughs> um, yeah, I wouldn't say I, I really enjoy it. Yeah, right. Yeah, and then there's the the magic uh, of the whole thing for the kids. You know, Father Christmas and how do you call him? Santa, Santa Claus. Santa Claus. Yeah. Santa Claus. Yeah. yeah. Well, Santa Claus. Santa Claus is real, kids. Yeah. Just in case you're playing yeah. along at home. Uh, but in this instance, this year we got to play Secret Santa, and by gosh, the a couple of the gifts that I got. Uh, at the at the Rigs Christmas party, uh, it was everything a teenage girl should know. It was a book by a, what I could only describe as a gentleman in his mid forties who looks like a sex predator, <laughs> <laughs> writing everything about uh, you know menstruation, masturbation, all the good stuff, boys, girls, you know, homosexuality. And he prefaces it all by saying, well, in my worldview, X, Y, Z. So it's not everything a teenage girl needs to know. But it was written in 1982, so this book is as old as I am. Almost old enough to vote twice over. <laughs> so it was, it was amusing to read some passages from the book for that very reason. But there you go, there's a little bit of insight into... The, the Christmas event at 
the Reeks family household with um, with a plus one with Alan. <laughs> but we're actually recording this. I, I don't think we've covered this off yet. I, I've had a couple of whiskeys, so this might be <laughs> that explains well, a lot. well lubricated. But we're actually recording this down a place called the Shoalhaven Gorge. So it's about a two, two and a half hour hike from the car park where in the middle of nowhere next to a river we've got a campfire going in the background there's periodically a little bit of a breeze uh, very occasionally you'll hear a plane go overhead but there's nothing here Al it is there's nothing <laughs> well yes there are a couple of things <laughs> what is there uh, Spartacus, Spartacus. The Goana. who's Spartacus the goanna. A goanna, yes. Yeah, so a goanna <laughs> is a, a kind of iguana. Mm-hmm. Um, it is about one metre, metre and a half long. Uh-huh. Uh, drop bears? What's a drop bear? Yeah, drop bears are a nightmare. Mm-hmm. Just a prank for tourists. Yeah, like well, we know yeah. this now, don't we? <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, talk to me about critical thinking, checking your, <laughs> your sources. Oh, okay, well... <clears throat> Actually, it is kind of relevant, so we'll discuss it. Uh, when Alan said, yeah, okay, look, well, I'll come over to Australia, I said, well, you just got to keep an eye out for the drop bears. And I sent him a page from the Natural History Museum of Australia, I think, and it has a reference to drop bears there and a, a brief description of, of what they do and how they look and how they act and, and what they do. And as we're hiking down here and there's no internet connection, uh, the, myself and uh, Matthew, who's my brother-in-law, began talking about all oh, these drop bears. They, you know, they're about 80, 90 kilos. They sit in a tree. They fall out of a tree, render you unconscious with their, their brute force, and then the others gather around for feeding. And poor Alan, given that you had no way to cross-check this information. Well, I would have <laughs> the first time you talked to me about it, but it was like, Two two o'clock in the morning yeah, for me. Yeah, we've all got problems. Yeah, I mean, I know. critical thinking yeah. waits for no man. Hmm. No, I just bloody trusted you. <laughs> <laughs> the guy knows what he's talking and, about. And where did that get you? Trusting a skeptic got you to insomnia. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Terrified that pitched with a tent under a tree. Yeah. That some roughly koala-shaped beast of about ninety kilos would come careening through your tent onto your face where the others would then gather around and feast upon your body Mm. good times yeah wonderful thank you Mm. thank you so much i'll I'll come again (laughs) so tomorrow we're heading we're hiking back out we're then going to the airport to pick up a couple of other skeptics from over in adelaide and then we're heading back to my house where we will shower for the first time in what would seem like a week yeah that'll be good (laughs) because christmas is now out of the way a month (laughs) in advance we've got christmas out of the way and then we'll head to uh, the australian skeptics convention where there's going to be some fantastic speakers like dick smith uh who's an australian entrepreneur uh dr carl kruzhnitsky who you're a big fan of alan yeah he's my hero (laughs) he's my rock star (laughs) What does he do? What's his story? Uh, well, for what I know, he's uh, the Mr. Science of the Australian radio and TV. A bit like Bill Nye for the Americans, yeah. Mm. yeah. Or Dr. Chris Smith for, the, um, for those who listen to the BBC, the naked scientist, Dr. Chris Smith. So, yes, we've got Dr. Carl speaking and, yeah, a whole bunch of other quite well-known sceptics. But I think as, as far as distance travelled to come to the Australian Skeptics Convention, you'd be up there. Yeah, <laughs> I probably. I think you're probably going to yeah. <laughs> maybe win a record. <laughs> so, guys, thanks for having us on the podcast, and all the very best. Take care. Bye. Yeah, Switzerland, yeah. So, um, that was Alan from Switzerland of uh, the podcast Science, uh, and Questionable Adam of uh, Adam Reeks of the Head Mentality Podcast. Uh, you can follow him at Adam Reeks. Yeah. 
uh, Head Mentality Podcast. That's a good one. Listen to that shit. Mm. Mm. Uh, so what Question Number Adam does, along with uh, some people that go to visit him in Australia on occasion and uh, meet up with his family, they avoid, we've talked a lot about the commercialisation of Christmas, and they kind of avoid the commercialisation of Christmas by essentially doing a secret Santa with shit gifts and then playing a game in which they can win those shit gifts off each other. We just had a very brief chat about that, didn't we, Mr. Watchtower? And? Um, and I uh, said, that sounds really sad, right? You know, like in a sort of like a dorky kind of way. Um, but, as you uh, pointed out, Mr. Watchtower... It circumvents... It circumvents the commercialisation aspect of Christmas and actually as I began to think about it more I thought well it's quite nice that you create a mini tradition within your own family Hmm. um, that doesn't require you to be sucked into the the the, the sort of the the dark side of the commercialisation aspects of Christmas yeah I think that focuses more heavily on your family getting together and having a bit of a laugh, essentially. And uh, we, um, Adam Reeks in, in that explains that one of the uh, one of the presents was a shit present. It was essentially like a shopping trolley that was miniaturised, from what, from what I gathered from that. Uh, and even though that it's essentially a shit present that nobody wants, they were all kind of, they all wanted the present, so they were fighting hard for it. Because in that time and place, I imagine that those presents suddenly become uh, a bit of an issue. Whereas... They paid probably. They probably paid nothing for them, but it's just it's just the sense of I want that because it's almost like a hilarious trophy, kind of like um in Friends when uh when uh Ross and Monica Geller sort of they 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 play they play American football for the trophy, which is like it's a big deal in their family, but it's just a troll on a piece of wood that's been nailed to the piece of wood. Yeah. But that's well, just but- tonight. Um, interestingly, on the on the subjects of trophies. <laughs> Um, you might look over my right shoulder, Mr. Watchtower, and see a trophy. Yeah. Um, now, tonight, when myself, my wife, and my two daughters were eating our tea, mm-hmm. I decided to uh, to go against um, the grain, if you like, as a parent. Now, most parents would say, take, take your time with your food. Yeah. But I do want you to eat it all. Well, tonight, I said, whoever finishes their meal the quickest gets that trophy. Really? Yeah. And it became a thing. And then uh, we kind of took a photograph with the winner of the trophy, who happened to be the nine-year-old daughter. Uh, The six-year-old was uh, very disappointed that she didn't win the trophy. Uh, It's hard not being the favourite, though, isn't it? Not as disappointed as me. Hmm. Um, But, yeah, you're right. The favourite child won the trophy, which is good. The uh, No, actually, no. I tell a lie. Right. She's the favourite in personality terms, but she was born out of wedlock. So that... that She's the bastard. I have to deduct a lot of... The bastard child, yeah. Okay. Uh, The younger one was born within marital wedlock, and therefore she's a legitimate human being, and I respect her unreservedly for that. Unfortunately, my nine-year-old doesn't ever get that respect because she was the result of a... Huge mistake, a huge extramarital mistake. Ooh, I'm I'm looking forward to when she's eighteen and I play this back to her. The the six year old was a huge intermarital mistake. <laughs> um, luckily, I love them both with all my heart, and I'm glad that mistakes happen. I can't remember which uh, which famous person said it. Might not have even been a famous person, but I remember a quote that says. Um, once you have children, your job is to create memories for your children. And I've always thought that, that's it. Bullshit. That. Your job is to feed them, and give them clothes, and buy them loads of presents at Christmas. I've always thought that, that, that was I've always thought that, that was a really good uh, way to live your life if you have children. Because um, I and you, we have encountered uh, far too many children that are kind of the result of... Um, that not being the case with their parents. And I think I think things like that, just dead simple things. Mm. Um, you know, creating tradition. Thanks, Adam. Merry Thanks, Christmas. Alan. Merry Christmas. Thanks, Alan. Bye. Thanks, Alan. Bye. 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 Second to last, um, we have Religious Tourist. You can follow him on Twitter, at Religious Tourist. 
I assume. I, did, I haven't checked that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's at to religious fair, tourist. If it isn't at religious tourist, the guy well, has no common it sense. Bloody well should be. <laughs> I think he's actually called religious eyebrows at religious tourist because rumour has it he has a man brow. Okay. Now, let me tell you this, Norris. In the new year, the Watchtower and Awakening is branching out and, and getting guests on. Not that that means that you will be ousted. Does it mean I get to meet Ricky Gervais? No, yeah. Oh. But uh, I'm going I'm to have a bit of a section where I'm going to try and uh, have a little bit of an interview with people over Skype or whatever. And uh, rumour has it, religious tourist will be my first ever guest. <gasps> now, we've tried to figure this out. We've tried to coincide so that we can record. And uh, his wife, Mrs. Tourist... She's been ridiculous and booked him a few days off, um, a few days on holiday, and she's interrupted our podcast recording plans. No. Have you checked that he's not scared of heights, by the way? Because of the height of the watchtower? Because it gets quite hairy up here. I don't think he's ready for the height of the watchtower, if I'm honest. I'll ask him about it when that happens. But uh, for those of you that don't know him, religious tourist uh, spent a year... I say a year, it was probably more like 14 or 15 months. But um, he spent a year spending each month as a slightly different version of uh, whatever religion he decided to follow that month. So one month he was a Muslim, one month he was a Jew, one month he was a Job's Witness, one month he was a Mormon, one month he was a Buddhist, one month he was a Jedi, true story. Um, and apparently he's writing a book about this. So I shall be interviewing him at the next available opportunity, but probably for January New Year podcast. Cool. Uh, so, without further ado, here is Religious Eyebrows at Religious Tourist. Here we go. Uh, yeah, I do celebrate uh, Christmas. I do, and we do, um, the family does. Uh, everyone does, really. It's um, what's not to enjoy. You've got the whole build-up, so all the Christmas songs and the, and the lights in the town and the, the chilly evenings and the, the, you know, the log fire and all that kind of, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then you've got the actual day with lots of food, lots of drinking. There's uh, good tunes on the stereo um, and the Christmas hats. Um, I'm a big, big fan of Christmas hats. I always, I always kind of judge people by how long um, they keep their hat on for. If they take it off, I always feel they're a bit, a bit no fun. Um, but I often keep mine on so long that I've forgotten I'm even wearing it. Um, it just becomes part of me. Uh, which is probably far too more, more far too more revealing than I needed to be um, on this. Um, but yeah, it's great fun. There's the the great day. Uh, I know a lot of people would have had a, a kind of religious holiday, and there would be uh, it would be a time to a lot of intense praying, whatever, or going to church and carol singing and stuff like that. But um, you know, I can enjoy that or not enjoy that. It, it depends. It depends what kind of mood I'm in. But yeah, Christmas as a whole is great fun. Um, I love Christmas songs. Um, whereas a lot of you will be bored of Christmas songs by mid-November. Um, I actually enjoy the holidays. I can sometimes even be found dancing around shops. And by July, almost like some kind of weird song addict, uh, I get withdrawal from, um, from the, festive, the festive tunes. And by myself, away from, <laughs> away from people who look down at me, I sometimes listen to Christmas songs in the middle of July. Is that wrong? Is that wrong? Don't judge me. Anyway, have a very good Christmas and uh, have look inside a Christmas, a Christmas card and one of those greeting cards. Whatever, whatever great thing it says. Just, just imagine I've said that, said that now. So, um, yeah, bye. Um, that's religious tourist for you. Doesn't religious tourist sound like a really jolly guy? He does, yeah, yeah. My bet is that he gets very depressed on his own. <laughs> yeah, he, sw- he switches off the podcast mic and then he just sulks into yeah. a corner. I, I reckon he cried himself uh, to sleep that night. Yeah. Simply because, as a person who experiences depression, um, I understand the, the pros and cons to being gregarious and happy. There's always a come down. So religious tourist, I hope that the come down wasn't too harsh. I hope you didn't have to harm anyone to make yourself feel better. I think um, I think I think he's the opposite though. I think he's the opposite of you. I think he's one of those people that's annoyingly jolly. Really? Yeah. Oh, I'd like to meet him just to I don't know, maybe to suck some of that positivity out of him. Where are you gonna suck it from? 
wherever he wants me to suck it from. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think he's annoyingly jolly. On- only someone that who is who is strangely positive would listen to Christmas songs in July. I think he shared with us a bit too much. Didn't no, he? I think that that's the sort of thing a really disturbed person would do. Jacob. Yeah, but maybe cloak it in. In warped happiness. Yeah, like he's walking around going, snow is falling yeah, yeah. all around yeah. me. Well, like a tear rolls down his cheek. He's a bit of a rebel, actually. Bit of a rebel. Bit of a rebel. <laughs> Only rebels listen to Christmas songs in July. Yeah. I think he's like, fuck Santa Claus. Yeah. I'm sticking on the Christmas tunes. No, he sounds like a lovely chap. He's, he's very jolly. <laughs> he's sat there in his Bermuda shorts listening to <laughs> snow is falling. That's brilliant. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Is it, is it, he's, he seems like a funny guy. I want him on the show. Yeah, no, he sounds like a nice guy. That, that, as everybody sound like a lovely person. Uh, yeah, I'd like to grab everybody on the show at some point. You'd like to grab everybody on the show. Now, yeah. you didn't realise that grabbing people... I can only really grab you, can't I? Because you're, uh, you're the only person who is physically here. I don't need a Skype conversation with you. I can actually touch you. I'm touching you right now. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Okay. Put, put a pouring noise in there. So, back up, back up, back up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm spent. Yeah. Um, just to remind me, um, a, uh, your man, tourist, religious tourist. tourist. Uh, <laughs> hey, your man. Uh, his point of view of Christmas. I don't think he has any point of view as opposed to like religious stuff. He seems to really enjoy it though. Yeah, he, he really Loves enjoys Christmas. it. Yeah, he's good. In, in a freaky kind of way, he enjoys it. And he. He, he, did, he did say, you know, people enjoy it. Some people might do want to do intense praying. Fair enough. Take it or leave it, whatever. But for him, he just loves Christmas hats and Christmas you know, songs. <laughs> you know, I, I love the term intense praying. I actually yeah. think that if you're going to pray, you might as well pray intensely. It's like, the, it's a good oh, oh, way oh. to pray. If you're going to pray anyone, if anyone's listening to this who's religious and you pray, I hope that when you pray, it's an intense Thing. I think unless you're praying intensely, I don't think your psychic projections are going to outrun everyone else's. Because yeah. if a lot of people are praying, some people are doing it half assed mm. I think God just sits up there, like sort of, you know, shaving his fingernails mm. and just. It brings me to Bruce yeah. Almighty, the scene um, with uh, Jim Carrey. All the post it notes. And the old Morgan Freeman. And he says, Right, now say a prayer. And I think he says, oh, Don't quote me on this. It's, but he says something like, Oh, I hope everybody in the world's uh, happy and uh, that people who are starving are okay and blah, blah, whatever he said. Hmm. And he goes, no, pray to me. And then he starts talking as you would talk about something that is deeply personal to you, that means something, how he's let down the love of his life. Yeah. How he's, uh, you know, and, and then at the end, Morgan Freeman, a.k.a. God, says... Oh, that's a prayer. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I feel like now we need to leave religious tourists behind, yeah. but we'll come back to him next podcast. Thanks, RT. Thanks. Merry Christmas. Uh, I feel like we need to leave him behind immediately because you've created a beautiful segue without even knowing it. Because next up is The Bible Reloaded. With Jake and Hugo. Uh, and Jake and Hugo, in their Bible Reloaded uh, episodes, every time they mention God, uh, they always use an image of Morgan Freeman. And you've just no. and you've just explained the Morgan Freeman God <gasps> from Bruce Almighty. Mm. And that's the same Morgan Freeman that they use in all of their episodes. Uh, if, if you haven't uh, been to watch or listen to The Bible Reloaded with Jake and Hugo, uh, actually with Hugo and Jake, do you remember when we did that song? Remember that? I don't. I don't remember it. No, I don't remember <laughs> dancing round. I'm a 31 year old man. I don't remember singing a song. La 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 yeah. la 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 la. I don't remember it. No, it, honestly, it's like, if I didn't remember that, would you not be worried about me? I would actually. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I kind of knew you remember, but I was just going to be like, you man, you. Know, uh, but in a way, I, part, I kind of wish I didn't remember it because if I didn't remember it, it would imply that. I had such a busy and fulfilled life that things like that just happen to me every day. So um, I'll link the I'll link the Bible Reloaded's uh, one year anniversary, well, one year birthday video below. Uh, and I think me and you were the first, 
the first um, people on it. Really? really? Yeah, I, th- I think so. I, th- I think I think we get the honorary mention, you know, before bronze, silver, and gold comes up. Really? The people that were redoing the Bible Reloaded theme tune. Thanks, Hugo. Thanks, Jake. Yes. Merry okay, Christmas. so uh, we're going to cut to um, the Bible Reloaded with Hugo and Jake. Woo! All right. So, as atheists, how do we, or do we celebrate Christmas? And if so, how do we do it? Hi, I'm Hugo, and I'm Jake. This is. Of course, this this is not the Bible Reloaded. It's so automatic. Sorry. And we're the Bible Reloaded. Go ahead. You want to go ahead? Uh, Sure. Um, I love Christmas. I love probably 95% of all the things that go into Christmas, minus obviously the religious stuff. Um, My family was never really that religious, so most of mine is very consumerist and happy and family-oriented and awesome. So, like, every year I get super pumped for buying people presents and being able to pick out things for them and being able to go have really nice food with all my, you know, relatives that I don't see all the time. And I like to spend time with people. And I like the, just the kind of, kind of the air around the community is always much more positive, uh, unless you're shopping. And, um, I don't know. I just, people seem to be a little bit nicer. People, uh, seem to be a little bit more caring. And, um, you know, if it's not shitty out, it's kind of it's kind of pretty out when there's snow all around because we live in Michigan in the U.S. So it's it's very snowy. I also celebrate Christmas. Christmas is probably one of my favorite times of the year. Some reason it just gets me in a good mood. You know, mm-hmm. it's kind of cold out, but you can get together with people, and there are blankets and fires, and it's just nice and cozy. Yeah. I like the iconography. I like the shows. I like the whole mood of the season. Um, and you know, I think when some people say that atheists shouldn't celebrate Christmas. I always think about, you know what else used to be a Christian holiday? Halloween. But look at what Halloween's become. It's become a completely cultural, uh, religiously neutral holiday. And I think that's kind of what Christmas is becoming. And it's kind of a nice thing. It's a thing that, as a nation, as Western parts of the world, can all be part of, Mm -hmm. regardless of your background necessarily. It just becomes a cultural celebration that we can all share. And that's what I like to think of it as. And, And I think that's a beautiful thing. But you know the best part about Christmas? What? Christmas morning, you get to watch Die Hard, which is the best Christmas movie. Woo! Not the sequels, though. Don't care about Russia, John McClane. Let it be. Don't care about Russia, John McClane. Let you it be. You can tell they haven't got kids, can't you? Oh, have they got kids? <laughs> they can't have kids. Right, if you've got kids, you no. don't watch Die Hard on Christmas Day morning. <laughs> you just don't. You might want to, but you don't. In fact... Everybody wants to. I'd love to. Yeah. I'd love to. I can't even watch it on Christmas night. Christmas Eve? Either or Christmas way. Day night? Either. Oh. I don't know. I can't watch it. Why can't I watch it? Because it has swearing in it. And I can't watch it as loud as I want to watch it, because Die Hard is, is, is better when you can turn the sound up. It is. Hear the gunshots. Hear the, the, the swearing in all its glory. But when you've got children in the house... You can't have a nine-year-old and... Did she six? Mm. You can't have a nine- and six-year-old and hear the words, yippee ki yay motherfucker. Yeah. Can you? No, because the, the, I'll tell you why. You can, but the reason you can't have a nine- and a six-year-old and hear the words, yippee ki yay motherfucker, on the TV is because you involuntarily react by saying very loudly... You be gay, motherfucker! <laughs> and do you know how you just shushed me then? Why did you shush me? Because, because your children are in bed. Six and a half year old is asleep in the room above me. Yes. Isn't it interesting that I tried to shush you and you're their dad? Yeah, but that interesting. So Jake and Hugo, uh, they're from Michigan, so they actually genuinely get a white Christmas in stark contrast to a black Christmas. I was gonna say it. In stark contrast to Adam Reeks's hot, sunny yeah, Christmas, yeah, they get a nice wintry Christmas. So, so they they seem to get. I, I get I get the feeling from them that they get like a true sort of. I say true Christmas. I don't think there's any true Christmas, but I think they get the fairy tale. The Catholics get a true Christmas, but, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I think they get like a. I think they get a 
a picturesque kind of, you know, uh, postcard mm. kind of Christmas mm. because they talk about like the iconography and loving it when it, it's cold outside and it's warm inside. Through I think Michigan. You, I think you use the term when it's shitty out. When it's shitty out. Now, when it's yeah, shitty yeah. out, does that mean when it's really snowy? Frostbite. <laughs> All right. See, my kids have been begging us for a snowy Christmas this year, and it's unfortunately it's not the kind of thing you can promise your children. Um, you know, but wouldn't it be great to have a guaranteed white Christmas? Or is that just something? Buy a snow machine. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wow, festive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, festive. But no, they, they seem to have a, a very positive outlook on Christmas. They seem to enjoy it. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's all about the family. It's all about. In fact, what I quite like was it was it Hugo who was saying that he really gets pumped about um, pumped pumped. Yeah. You know, we say that all the time in England. Hugo, we get pumped about stuff. No, I we think, don't. I think- pumped means to be. Well, buggered if you're a gay man, or vaginally penetrated if you're a heterosexual woman. Actually, you could be vaginally penetrated by a, a, a lesbian woman with a device. What kind of device? I don't know. Usually made of plastic or rubber, and often... Synthetic. ...shaped peenly. Mm. Um, so, anyway... We don't really say pumped unless we're talking about um, extramarital affairs. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so you you said you get pumped about buying people presents. And I thought, that's lovely. That's nice that you get excited about buying other people gifts because I dread Christmas for that very reason. Because I think, shit, I've got to think about all these different people and what would they like and... I get that I'll feel good once I've bought them a present, but what happens to me is I get so overwhelmed by thought that I have to buy everybody presents that I don't actually end up buying anyone presents. I leave it all to my wife, and then I have to pretend not to be surprised when somebody (laughs) opens a gift that I bought them. (laughs) And you're like, yeah, I really thought about you, didn't I? And when people come to me and say, thanks so much for the present, I have to pretend that... I know exactly what it is they got. Thanks, Mrs. Norris. I say, yeah, no problem, mate. I thought you'd like it. And the answer always is, yeah, I did. And then there's a huge silence when they're expecting it to fill it with something like, because I always knew you liked to toast marshmallows. S'mores to the... uh, Uh, I don't know. I don't know. S'mores is marshmallows and chocolate, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, oh. I know you like it because we knew that you were really into. I don't know. What do you get people at Christmas? This is the problem. Socks. I don't have socks. Perfect. Perfect. We know that you wear socks every day. I know you've got feet. And we know you have a personality, and therefore you like socks with a personality. Hmm. Anyway, point is, I don't know what we buy people. And it's always awkward when they thank me for the present that I was supposed to have bought them and I don't know what it was. Mm. And it's especially awkward when it's my children doing that. Yes. Anyway, I'm just as surprised as my children when they open their Christmas (laughs) presents. Is that bad? Is that bad? Yeah. Should I be surprised when my child opens their present? Actually, often, it's not surprised, it's shocked. And then we have a little discussion, me and my wife, about how much this present actually was, you know, because So you shocked shocked twice. You're like, wow, that's a good present. Wow, that was great. Mummy got you. How much was that? (laughs) (laughs) Mr. Talgin is like, wow. My my six-year-old goes, good joke, daddy. Seeing as you bought it, you obviously know how much it was. Not at that price. No. Kids, I'd just like to say that if daddy was in charge of present buying... (laughs) <laughs> you wouldn't have got that this year. You'd just have a tangerine in the bottom of your uh, giant sock. What are they called? Stockings. Mm. Stockings. Anyway, sorry. Uh, I feel like I've gone off on a tangent. So a I, tangerine? I think I you was. just mentioned tangerine. <laughs> We've just gone off on a tangerine. I was, I was going to finish off by asking you how you celebrate Christmas, but, but I, th- I think you've interjected with enough of it. But just tell me what you think Christmas is to you, or rather, as a lapsed Catholic how do you celebrate it and try and keep it within about a paragraph? 
That's impossible, and you know it. Try it. Okay. Um, to me, obviously, since having children, the magic of Christmas has exploded in our lives. It's amazing the excitement that children have for Christmas, and you can't help but feed off that excitement. Uh, so it's a time for family, it's a time for friends, it's a time for eating lots of lovely food, it's a time for drinking, it's a time for not working, uh, oh, should I say, not working without the guilt of not having a job. Hmm. In fact, that's probably the best part of Christmas this year, because I'm currently unemployed, <laughs> so I get to be unemployed with a little bit less guilt because everybody else isn't working as well. Anyway, uh, but I was going to actually say, there was a point that I, I thought of before. Um, when, I, when I grew up, um, the religious aspect of Christmas was really prevalent. It was very important to my parents. Uh, we always went to Mass at Christmas. And I have to say, I really enjoyed going to Mass on Christmas Eve because we, we had a little tradition where we'd go over to my nan's house and we'd take my nan to midnight mass it was called but it was actually about nine o'clock on christmas eve and we'd go and there'd be a choir and they'd sing carols and do you know what it was almost like i almost felt i, can't, I don't want to say smug but I, I, I felt like i knew the true meaning of christmas because once you go to a, when you go to church on Christmas Eve, especially as a Catholic, you go to church on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, but we prefer Christmas Eve because it meant we didn't have to go to church on Christmas Day. And mm. we could just have an uninterrupted day of opening Christmas presents and eating and stuff. Yeah. Um, when you've been to church and you've seen, you know, you, you generally church is full over Christmas. And churches look beautiful at Christmas. They have a huge crib, that's lovely, really well lit, and there's a little, you know, the whole uh, the crib scene going on with the shepherds, the, the 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 three kings, and Jesus and Mary and Joseph, and a few donkeys and a bit of hay, and uh, <coughs> and you've got the lights around church, and uh, you've got a choir, a full choir singing Christmas carols, and everybody's generally happier and merrier, and you know, you have the service. You're reminded of the, inverted commas, true meaning of Christmas. And actually, what was nice about being reminded about the true meaning of Christmas is that it actually reminded you that Christmas wasn't just about buying presents for people. It was about sharing a bit of love in the community. It was about wishing your neighbour who is lonely a Merry Christmas. It was about inviting neighbours into your home over Christmas. It was about going to visit people who you've not seen for a while, especially elderly relatives or sick relatives, etc. So it's quite a nice antidote to the commercialisation aspect of Christmas. Um, but also after church, you'd have a lovely little get together with the community, say hello, possibly even a small glass of sherry or something. And then Christmas has begun. And I've got to say, I have to say this, since I have stopped believing, I do miss that aspect of Christmas. Hmm. And, and I, I can't put my finger on what it is I miss, whether it's the community aspect, whether it's the the, set, the, the sense of elitism in knowing the true meaning of Christmas. Knowing. Okay? <laughs> knowing, yeah. Um, you know, because there is that. Sometimes you think, you know, I know what Christmas is actually about, the true story behind Christmas. Um, so you feel quite good about yourself for that. But also it's, it's, I don't know, it's a feeling that, I, th I, mean, I just said it then, the antidote to Christmas, you feel like you've taken part in something that is quite special. It's about thinking about the, the, the people who are in most in need over Christmas. And quite often, we don't get to do that because all we're really thinking about is the presence, the food, the drink, the opulence, the joy, the rest, the drink, the food, the family. And the food again. And the food again. Mm. So you kind of, you, 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 if you're not careful, Christmas becomes almost an indulgent, time 
and you forget that for a lot of people it's tremendously lonely and miserable. Yeah. And that's what church does. It actually helps to remind you of people who are at the most vulnerable over Christmas. I would say all those things are hugely important. Um, hugely important for human civilization and mm. hugely important for people mm. in general. But actually, there's something quite lovely about a story of... The, the, the Christmas story is... You know, it's been said many a time. It's one of the best stories ever told. I mean, it stood the test of time over a couple of thousand years. You know, you've got a woman who's been impregnated by an angel. She's going to be give, giving birth to the, to the... Well, she's going to be giving birth to the... Oh, yeah, true. The, the angel broke the news. <laughs> and God has just impregnated her. Uh, she's giving birth to the son of God. Hmm. She She's poor. She's, a, she's essentially a peasant. Uh, her husband's a... A lowly carpenter. They have to. She goes into labour. She has to find somewhere to stay. Everybody turns her away, and eventually they find this little manger, and they and she gives birth there. And the, the the son of God is born in such modest and meek surroundings, and you know, you've got the three kings who travel to to deliver gifts and to spread the news, and the North Star. That's the thing that leads them to the to the to the manger. It's quite a nice story. It's a nice. It creates nice images. You know what I mean? Especially as a kid, when you think about it, and especially you go to church and there's a huge star over the manger, and you just imagine this really simplistic um, story. It's a nice story to 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 get sucked into, hmm. um, and in a way, it's probably nicer than the commercialization side of Christmas. True story. The other co-host, Bonaventure, she overheard a conversation in a pub not two days ago that went like this. One guy said, I went to watch my son in the nativity play last night and his friend said to him, what was it about? No. That's a, re- that's a real thing. I went to watch my son in the nativity. What was it about? Wow. That's how far removed people are from the quote, true meaning of Christmas. Well, I went Strange, to watch my it? daughter in the nativity play this week. You did? And do you know what? I was immensely proud. Uh, uh, I spoke to my friend of mine about this and uh, he's an atheist. Um, and I sent him a picture of my daughter. She was dressed as an angel. And, uh, and I was so proud because she delivered her lines clearly um, at the just at the right volume, she projected a voice. She injected expression and intonation, and it was amazing. She's six and a half, and I was blown away by the energy and enthusiasm she put into the performance. I was a little bit cringy at times at the words she was saying because obviously it was all about God and Jesus and stuff. But um, you know, I sent a picture to my mate, and I said something like. Oh, uh, this is. I was really proud of my daughter tonight. She was a mate. She stole the show in the in the nativity, but the script was uh, was a little bit far fetched, hmm. right? And instantly, my mate came back with, "If you wanted to be fingered by priests, that's your business." <laughs> right? <laughs> it was instantly straight into the child abuse <laughs> aspect. <laughs> and it was like, it's like, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. What can you say? Um, so, yeah. so what we're saying is, there's some good aspects of the Catholic Church, and there's some that are really yeah. not that good. The as- yeah, the good aspects are that you get to learn how to perform on a stage and express yourself. The downsides are that you have to be fingered against your will. I spoke with uh, Bonaventure on the last episode about this, and. Um, we we need we need to we need to devote an entire podcast to uh, child molestation. As much as it's not going to be hilarious, it will be informative. If it's hilarious, that's probably unbroadcastable, isn't it? Let's let's do a hilarious <laughs> podcast about child molestation. I feel uh, <laughs> I, I feel we're moving away. I feel like we're moving away from the Christmas. Oh yeah, theme. Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> okay, right. Let's wrap this up. Uh, thanks, everybody that took part. Out. Thanks everyone that sent in your audio, and I'm just I'm just gonna I'm just gonna finish off uh, on on watchshineawakening.com. 
uh, the blog post entitled An Atheist at Christmas. I'm literally just about to read my final paragraph just to sort of summarise uh, my view of Christmas or mm-hmm. the way I do Christmas, shall I say. Okay, um, I'll celebrate the season of goodwill because I live in a society that has bestowed a two-week holiday upon me. That was nice of them, wasn't it? Uh, I also live in a society that has gradually shed religious practices and adopted pagan ones. A celebration of this kind, to me, is simply a nod to our ancestry and a time for peace to all men, a concept explicitly lacking in ancient religion. I shall give and receive gifts, I will eat, drink and be merry, I will wear hideous knitwear and attempt to engage people in conversation about the only thing they want to avoid while celebrating Christmas. Religion. This has been uh, the Watch Our and Awakening Christmas special. Say goodbye to the fans, Norris. Goodbye to the fans, Norris. Me. Hey. Uh, goodbye, fans. Uh, at this time of year, when we're thinking about baby Jesus and his God, our Father, uh, I don't think he actually exists, but if he does, may he strike us down. <laughs> <laughs>